How many of you know uh, the last part of this verse? I'm going to test your Bible knowledge. Thanks, Joe. I'm going to test your Bible knowledge real briefly. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus talks about the first and greatest commandment and also the one that's like unto it. But it says this. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You know, I've always wondered what it meant, you know, really, really meant to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, now, don't worry, we're not in Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 22, we're going to be in John chapter 4. So if you'll turn to John chapter 4 this morning, I'm going to give you some context as we go there. Just want to mention that basically what's happening is Jesus is growing in popularity. He's becoming a little more famous. He's making more and more and more disciples. And, and some of the Pharisees are getting jealous. And, and, and they thought they were jealous of John. And now John's disciples are pushing people towards Jesus. And so that's the context in which we see ourselves in, in John chapter 4. And today I want to talk about true love. Not in a romantic sense, but, but true love in the sense that Christ commanded us to do what? To love our neighbors as ourselves. That's the type of love I kind of want to talk about today. We see it in John chapter 4. And, and I want us to, to go to John chapter 4 and just go through the story. We're going to go through the entire chapter Four of, of John. So it, it's going to be a, a lengthy thing, but uh, we're going to go through a lot of it. We're not going to get bogged down, um, but I want to see the whole story uh, of John chapter 4. Before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing on the word this morning. Father, I ask that you would speak to me today. I pray that you would speak to everybody here, that your word would not go uh, forth without, without doing something, Lord, without changing people, without changing me. Father, that we would hear your word and, and be convicted by your spirit. And Lord, that we would leave this place uh, ready to change, willing to change, and then taking action to change. God, I pray that you would just help us to see what true love is, what it looks like in our communities, in our families, with our neighbors, with our friends, with our colleagues, or with everybody we come into contact with on a daily basis. And I pray, Father, that you would receive all the glory and all the praise. It's in Christ's name I pray these things. Amen. So John chapter 4 is where we're going to be. I want us to be observers, observers this morning. I just want to kind of look at John chapter 4 and, and, and look at some different things um, that we can see. And, and there's going to be three main things that I want to convey to you that true love is. Okay, This is what I want you to know, that true love is something. And when we're talking about relationships and when we're talking about uh, loving that person or loving another person the way that Christ has commanded us to love, there's, there's a specific thing that it looks at. And the first thing that it looks like is true love is intentional. True love is intentional. If you're taking notes, this is one of the first things you want to write down. True love is intentional. Let's look at verses 1 through 8 of John chapter 4. John chapter 4, it says, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making... And baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. I want us to see in these first eight verses that Jesus was very intentional here. Look at verse number four. It says, And he had to pass through Samaria. Question. Did Jesus have to do anything? <laughs> I mean, really, did he have to do anything? You see, Jesus had an option here, and I want us to give, give us a, a visual idea of what's going on. Judea was at the bottom, Galilee was at the top, and in the middle you had Samaria. So geographically, Jesus had a couple options uh, to, get, to, get, to get up to, to Galilee. And so he could go around to the right, he could go around to the left, or he could go straight through Samaria. Now, when I heard this, I thought of Atlanta. <laughs> I thought of 285, I thought of 75 and 85 going right through the heart. And um, I'm thinking, man, that's kind of like it was, you know. And, and, and obviously it wasn't a highway, but they would travel this. But, but the normal thing for them to do, especially the Pharisees, what, was to go to the right and go to the east and cross over the Jordan, go up, cross back over, and come into Galilee. Now they did this because why? 
they did not like the Samaritans, did they? And vice versa. The Samaritans did not like the Jews. And, and so they, they had this, this thing going on where basically they would do everything in their power to avoid Samaria. They would go out of their way. Sometimes they would go to the west, sometimes they would go to the east, but very rarely would they take the direct northern route, right? The straightest, the, the straightest, the quickest distance between two points is a straight line. So that would be the sensible thing, but most of them didn't do that, and it was all because of this bad relationship with the Sumerians. But in verse number four, he, it says, and he had to pass through Samaria. Now this was intentional. Jesus did this intentionally. This was, this was pre-planned. This was thought out. This was not by accident. Jesus didn't have to do that so that, so that you know, he could make good time and get to Galilee at a good time. He didn't do it because somebody made him. He didn't do it because he was tired and he just had to go through Samaria so he wouldn't go all the way around. No, no the phrase here, he had to, means in the context of the Father's perfect will. So he had to be intentional about what he did, when he did it, where he went, how he went, all those things. Look at verses 5 through 6. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Here's more intentionality. Think about this. Jesus goes and, and he sits down by the well. Why? He's tired, right? Jesus was a man. He was 100% God, but he was 100% man. So he goes and he sits down at the specific well, and the Bible mentions a specific time. It was about the when? The sixth hour, which really would have been about noon. Some Bible scholar says that it's six o'clock in the evening, but I don't believe so because of some of the other things we're going to see here in a moment. But it was about noon, so the hottest, probably one of the hottest, close to the hottest part of the day. And Jesus comes, and he comes to this town, and, and he goes to this well, and, and there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. In verse number 7, it says that. And Jesus says to her, give me a drink. Now, what I want us to just stop for a moment and recognize is, is how intentional this all was. Jesus had options. I, I mean, literally, Jesus could have teleported if he wanted to, right? Beam me up, Lord. And, and, and boom, he's in Galilee. But he was on a mission. He was on a specific journey. The Lord had, had specific things for him to do. And so he was intentional about specifically, specifically going to Samaria, going through Samaria, going to this specific town, going to this specific well, at this specific time. It was all intentional. Specifically intentional. These were not just happenings. They were not just coincidences. This story was, did, just didn't just happen by chance. It, we wouldn't call it just something that was serendipitous, right? It wasn't just a good occasion. He met someone by chance, and it turned out to be good. No, everything here points to this being very intentional by Christ himself. John MacArthur says this, The stage was set. Jesus was in the right place at the right time for an encounter in God's will. He was in reality keeping a divine appointment that he himself had made before the foundation of the world. Think about that for a moment. This meeting that we're about to read of with the Samaritan woman was made before the foundation of the world. You know, I believe that God desires for you and for me to be intentional when it comes to meeting people like this. Now, obviously, we can't see the future like Christ said. We, we can't know some of the things that Christ knew. But we can sure be intentional about how we want to interact with people on a daily basis. 1 Peter 3.15 says this, But sanctify or honor the Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You see, God has an appointment for you. For everyone in this room today, if you're a believer, God has an appointment for you to meet with someone. I don't know when it is. I don't know where it is. I don't know how it's going to happen or unfold, but God has an appointment for you. Just like God had perfect plans for Christ to meet this woman at this well at 12, God has an appointment for you and for me. But we must be intentional. True love is intentional. You think about a love relationship, the way that that, that, that love relationship works is that you're intentional. You do things intentionally even when you don't feel like doing them, Right? So, so we need to kind of eliminate feelings when it comes to true love, and that sounds contradictory to everything that society tells us. 
You know, you fall in love and that type of mentality. But Christ would say, no, we need to be intentional because everything in this story indicates preparation and intentionality. Christ knew he had a purpose. He knew he had a specific person to meet. He was ready. He was prepared. He was purposeful in meeting with this woman. And I believe God gives every believer a divine appointment. Do you believe that? I mean, be honest with yourself this morning. Do you believe that God has divine appointments for you set up this next very week? I hope you believe that. Man, that, that gets me charged up. That gets me, me excited about what God has planned for me. And, and, and sometimes it's a, a little more difficult being in ministry because, you, you know, when you go outside these four walls, you, you don't go to our normal job. The places you go are gas stations and, you know, barber shops and grocery stores and gyms and places like that. But we have stories of people in our own congregation who are intentional every week about meeting people about looking and keeping their eyes peeled for what God is doing in and around them at a gas station, at a grocery store, at a restaurant, at their school, at their place of work. Jesus was intentional, and true love is intentional. You think about Esther, and you think about that phrase, for such a time as this. And you want to get your spirits lifted? Are you down in the dumps? Realize God has a divine appointment for you. You have a purpose to fulfill in terms of another person's life to possibly eternally impact that person. What a great, great responsibility to have. The first thing we need to understand is that true love is intentional. The second thing I want us to see is found in verses 7 through 27, and it's that true love is intrusive. Now, that sounds a little weird, but true love is intrusive. And let's look at verse number 7, and we'll start there. And Bear with me. Now, now. Just get the story, okay? Don't get bogged down in a verse. Don't get tripped up. Stay with me. Let's go through this story. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. There's more intentionality. I think Christ planned right there for those disciples to leave. Okay, because if they had been there, they would have said this. What in the world are you doing, Jesus? What, what are you doing talking to her? And so there's more intentionally. Let's keep going. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food, verse 8, verse 9. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. See, the first thing that happens here is that Christ is intentional, but then he's intrusive. Well, how is he intrusive? He's intrusive because he speaks to a woman. That, that's the first thing. Now, you ever think about why the Bible said that it was at the sixth hour, which would be noon? You see, the common practice was for women to go to the well in the evening time when it had cooled off. But this woman went at noon, the hottest part of the day. And you know, there were also other wells closer to this woman that she could have gone to, but she didn't. Why did she not do that? We see in a little bit that this woman was caught up in sin. She was embarrassed. She was probably ridiculed from those around her. And and she did everything in her power to avoid those people ridiculing her and, and being shamed. And so she went to a well that probably wasn't close to her in the hottest part of the day. So she's there. And Jesus gets intrusive by, first of all, he says, give me a drink. I mean, think about Jesus saying that to this woman. She's, she's getting water there. He comes and sits by the well, and he turns to her and says, give me a drink. And, and the first thing that, that, that comes to mind is this is a huge social, uh, you know, wrong. I mean, it's something that you just didn't do back then. You didn't talk to a woman in public, not even your own wife. Man, How would you like to grow up in that culture? You know, it's still around. 
You know, they still treat women like dogs in some areas of the world. They still treat them with disrespect and as they're, they're second citizens or even animals. But Christ treats her as she should be treated. A, 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 a human soul. A person with feelings and, 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 and needs and, and cares and hurts. And he talks to this woman. But not only is she a woman, which is a lower class in that day and age, but she's a Samaritan. So, like, if you want to talk to the worst person you could talk to in this time, Jesus is talking to her. Bad, bad no-no, right? Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. You don't talk to women. You don't talk to Samaritan women. You're a Jew. She'll defile you just by talking to her. So that's the stage. And, and Jesus gets intrusive. And, and he does something that's shocking. And, and he talks to this woman. And, and then verses 10 through 15, he, he starts to explain what he's doing, why he's there. And he, he talks about the water. And they're on two different pages, okay? They're on two separate pages. What do I mean by that? The woman is talking about physical things, material things, literal things. Jesus is talking about spiritual things. He's talking about heavenly things. And so they're on two different pages, and and he gets a little more intrusive, and, and she's thinking literal, physical, he's thinking spiritual, and he tells her, look, I'm what you're looking for. I'm what you need. I know more about you than you know about yourself. And this water won't satisfy, but I'll satisfy. You drink of me, and I will satisfy your soul. And so he's getting deeper and deeper, more intrusive, more intrusive. Can you imagine going up to the gas station and saying, hey, give me a drink. Hey, why don't you buy me a cup of coffee? Hey, why don't you do... Jesus, he didn't hold back here. He he crossed so many social norms... And it was so shocking that I, I think if the disciples were there at that time that he did that, one of them would have came and literally dragged him away. Obviously, I don't know that for sure, but, but I want you to understand how socially wrong this was, that he talked to this immoral woman. What's the, what's the place in downtown Atlanta with the, the, uh, the five corners or, or something like that? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Little Five Points. What's Little Five Points known for? Food and homosexuals, right? I mean, you, you go down to little five points and you, sell, you see the rainbow flag, rainbow flag, rainbow flag. I mean, it's on tons and tons of businesses. They're not ashamed of it. They, they're, they're out and open about it. And I, I say that to give you a little bit of visual of, of what it would look like for Christ to go into something like that and, and talk to the person that's the most flamboyantly homosexual person there and treat them with respect and love. That's what he's doing here. Do we do that? Do we act like that as believers? Are, are we intrusive to the point that we might have to lower ourselves? He lowers himself. He debases himself. He humbles himself. Why? Because he had a divine appointment with this woman. He wasn't too proud. He wasn't too busy. And he comes and he talks to this woman, this Samaritan. And they're on two different pages and he's trying to talk to her and she's not getting it. Verses 16 through 19, he says this. He said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to her, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. (laughs) She's like... You must be a prophet. You just told me that everything that I know that I was you know, concealing from you, and this, this woman is, is playing it coy. She's, she's a little, I think, a, a little mean-spirited because she doesn't want to deal with anybody, and Jesus is intrusive. True love is intrusive. You have to care enough to maybe get your toes stepped on a little bit, to feel uncomfortable a little bit, to get out of your social norm, to do things you might not normally do. He does all those things, and he comes to this woman, and he convicts her, and he he gets intrusive, and, and he just cares. He cares so much that he doesn't care what anybody else thinks. He cares so much that he doesn't care what she thinks. And he calls her out on her sin. You know how you know when somebody cares, when they're intrusive? I have one friend that will call me out on the carpet on a few things. Boy, he annoys the tar out of me sometimes. But he also is my best friend. 
because he cares enough about me spiritually to not let me go on sinning. And Jesus here cares enough about this person. It's kind of like, you know, when you and your spouse or you and a loved one begin to fight, or, or maybe, uh, you know, you think everything's over, the fight subsides and calms down. A day goes by and, and your wife still is kind of in a weird mood and you say, honey, what's wrong? Hmm. Nothing. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. Honey, what's, what's, what's wrong? Seriously, I know something's wrong. Oh, nothing. Don't worry about it. Everything's okay. You see, the person that cares, the person that truly loves, will be more intrusive until they get to the heart of the matter. They poke and they prod and they get it out of you, right? Because they know that you need to get it out and to get it out there on the table and to maybe work some through, through some things. And Jesus does this with the woman. He cares so much that he, that he confronts her in a loving way about her sin and about who she is and about what he knows. We don't do that a lot in our society, do we? It's easy to exchange pleasantries, right? It's easy to talk about the weather. It's easy to talk about sports. It's easy to talk about this and that and political things even sometimes. It's very difficult to care enough to be a little bit intrusive. You know, there's a song, and it's, I think, from the Andy Griffiths, you know, I Miss Mayberry, sitting on the front porch, drinking ice-cold cherry Coke, where everything is black and white. Ba-dum, ba-dum, ba-da-da-da-dum. <laughs> You know that song, you know the show where people are sitting on the porch and their neighbors are friendly and they talk to them and people know other people and it's very communal. We don't live in that society anymore. That's, that's long gone. But the irony is that Christ calls, calls us to live in that such a way, in that way, to, to, to engage people, to care enough to be a little intrusive. You ever done something nice for someone in a random spot? in a restaurant, in a gas station, in, in, in a public place, and, and they look at you like you've lost your mind? You ever spoken to someone that doesn't know you in a public place just to be cordial and to, to try to make a friend or to try to truly be a little intrusive for the good, and they look at you like, who are you and why are you talking to me? <laughs> We've all been there, right? And Christ does this with this woman. Think about the expression on her face when Jesus literally opens his mouth and speaks to her. Christ calls us to do the same, to get out of our normal habits. And, and every, oper- every time we go out to the gas station, the grocery store, the restaurant, uh, school, work, wherever we go on a daily basis, it's in a divine appointment by God to possibly meet someone and change your life, not just here and now, but for all of eternity. What a great, great thought. What a great, great opportunity. What an amazing thing to have before us every day. The opportunity to change someone's not only life, but eternal destination. Jesus was intrusive, and true love is intrusive. When's the last time you and I got intrusive? I don't mean being rude. I don't mean calling out someone's sin. I just mean digging a little deeper because you care about that person. It's not found really in our society today. And it really wasn't in this day, in this particular situation, what should have been the social norm. Jesus did something very strange here. So first of all, he's intentional. Second of all, he's intrusive. And aren't we to do the same thing? Aren't we to be intentional? Aren't we to be intrusive with every conversation, every opportunity, every word? What did Jesus do in these verses right here? In a phrase, he pointed people to himself. He pointed people to himself. He was the Messiah. He pointed people to himself. In your daily dealings, in your outgoings, in the places you interact, do you point people to Jesus? It's not as hard as you might think. Uh, you guys probably know the stories of, of Mike and Diane and the Jesus stories of Johnny, and, and we have several other people that do this already, engage waitresses and waiters in conversation, and they talk about something like that, that they engage them in more than just the physical. It might start there. They engage them in more than just the material or the literal. They engage them for those reasons first that eventually goes to the spiritual and hopefully eventually goes to pointing to Christ. You see, that's the reason, and that's why we should be able to get over our fears and our phobias of speaking to someone in public or or taking that step and being a little intrusive. Taking a risk and saying, all right, I'll do it. I'll talk to this person. I I was at Walmart, and I I parked, and as I parked, I saw this young kid. He was 
uh, he had a basketball and he had headphones on. And he was just minding those, his own business and doing his own thing. And, um, and <laughs> I'll be honest, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not an extrovert. How many of you guys know that about me? I'm, I'm an introvert, okay? If you thought I was an extrovert, you're wrong. I'm an introvert. And so little things like that are difficult for me. And I really need to rely on the Spirit of God and, and just simply choosing to do these things to, to act on those things. But, but I went up to the, I, I initially said, all right, no, I, I don't want to do it. He, he looks like he's busy, whatever, you know. And I went into Walmart, and as I'm in Walmart, I said, Lord, if he's still there when I come out, then I'll talk to him. <laughs> you know, you make those compromises with the Lord. And sure enough, the Lord's like, yep, he's going to be there. So I came out, and, and I talked with him a little bit. I told him about our church. I told him about uh, the Why I Believe series. I told him, I don't know if you have a church. And, and I just, it, it didn't last long, but I just invited him. And you know, he just, he said this, he, all he said was this. Thanks, man. <laughs> and it shocked me that he was so responsive. That was a, a good response. Uh, you know, I thought he, he, he was going to be obstinate. I thought maybe he would reject me. I thought all these bad things. And that's what our minds do. When Christ calls us to, to engage with people, we think the absolute worst thing is going to happen. They're going to spit in our face and kick us in the shin and say, get out of here, you Bible thumper. And 99% of the time, that doesn't happen, right? It doesn't happen. Why? Because people are hurting. This woman was hurting. This woman needed help. This, need, this woman needed hope. And you know, that's the majority of people today. 99% of the people you come across, they're hurting. They need help. They need hope. And they're just waiting and looking for that glimmer of hope. And maybe it's you that has a divine appointment with that person. And all it takes is being intentional and being just a little bit intrusive. Caring enough to say something. So we need to be intentional. We need to be intrusive. Lastly, true love is an investment. Look at verses 28 through 42. It gets a little lengthy in here, so just stick with it. Stick with me. He says in verse 28, So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to them, Come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? Then went out of the, they went out of the city and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you did not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, No one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, My food is, not, is to do the will of, of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Again, he's talking about intentionality here. He's saying he, have, he has a purpose above any physical matter. Do you not say, verse 35, there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored, others have labored and you have entered into their labor. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. See, I got this vision, uh, and, and I don't know if it's accurate, but I got this, this thought, this, this, this mental picture of, uh, of the disciples coming back, seeing him at the well, seeing Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman, being appalled, not understanding what's going on. Jesus stands up and says, look, time has passed a little bit, and, he, and maybe he points out, and the disciples turn around, and what they see is this field of white, coming towards them. And and he sees these people who this lady had gone and told about the Messiah. He sees them coming towards them. And he says, look, the fields are white and ready for harvest. I've prepared it beforehand. I've made divine appointments. And by this one divine appointment, man, this town was rocked. And people came to Christ. And they trusted in him. And they believed that he was the Messiah. Why? Because Christ took the time. He was intentional. He was intrusive. And, he, and one person who was a, a, a dirty, rotten sinner, just like each one of you and me, and he invested and he cared enough to speak to her, and she went out and told others about him. Christian, aren't we called to do this? 
I, I, I mean, you can give me one of these if you want. Are we not called to do this? Why are we not? Why is not every day a divine appointment? I'll tell you why for me, because I'm selfish and I'm lazy and, and I get preoccupied with my own life. And Christ calls us to get out of that <laughs> and, and to make those divine appointments count and to be intentional. It takes work. Christianity and, and living the Christian life and witnessing and talking to people about Christ and the church, it takes hard work and we don't want to do it. I'll, I'll be the first to admit because my, my sin nature takes over and I'm worried about little things that mean, will mean nothing in eternity instead of worrying about what Christ has called us to worry about. What did she do? Look at verse 29. Verse 29 says, Come, see a man who told me all the things that I have ever done. This is not the Christ, is it? Look also at verse number 39. It says, From that city many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things that I have done. What did she do there? It's real simple. It's in our Christian vocabulary. She gave her testimony. She didn't have to know the books of the Bibles memorized. She didn't have to know all this knowledge and all these things. She had a true encounter with the Savior of the world, and she told people about it. She spoke. <laughs> it meant something to her so much that she went and told who she could. By the way, was men, because the, woman, the women wouldn't talk to her, because probably some of those men were the men that she was sleeping with. And she comes and tells whoever she can. To, and some of the men are probably like, I wonder if this guy really does know what I've done. <laughs> Uh-oh. And they come, and they're convicted of their sin, and some of them meet Christ. Man, if we could just get past ourselves and our hang-ups and stop trying to be so spiritual all the time and looking the right way and, and performing the right way and just say, hey, I'm just a sinner just like you. Let me, te let me tell you about someone who saved me from my sin. Can we be passionate about that? Can we long for that to be in our lives and, and, and to, to have just a desire not only to know Christ, but to make Him known? I need it too. I need it probably more than some of you. You want a life that's worth living. You want a life that's meaningful. It's found here in Christ. The whole, the whole crux of this is, and I, and I passed it, and I know that I did it, so all you Bible scholars, don't worry. The crux of this passage is that Jesus is the living water. But people have to know and hear about the living water in order to taste and see that he is good and to be saved. And it's our job to do that. Heck, it's not our job. It's our privilege to do that. It's our joy to do that. Has someone invested in you? See, true love is an investment. It's an investment. And that's what Jesus did with this woman. He made an investment. True love is an investment. You're here today more than likely because somebody was intentional because somebody was intrusive because somebody made an investment in your life. Shouldn't we do the same? Here's the question I have for you today. Will you decide to love like Jesus loved? We, we saw a story. We didn't get too deep into scripture, but we saw a story today, a real story of what it looks like to, to really love, to see what true love looks like in a relational level with people that you might encounter every day. And the question is, will you decide to love like Jesus loved? I want to make it as practical as I can this morning. So I want to do something just a little bit different. And you guys have noticed probably the bottle water is back there. And that's what I want to talk about just for a second. Um, put up the 30 for 30 slide, would you, Mike? 30 for 30 challenge is, is what we're doing for the next 30 days. What's today's date? March 2nd. How many days are there in March? 31. So that means we have 30 days, including today, to do this challenge. What it is, is very simple. I'm going to ask you, if you're a believer, if there's been a point in time in your life when you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you're not leaning on any works, but you've solely trusted in Him, you believe He is God, you believe He died for you and for your sins, and that He rose from the grave, if that's you, if that's you this morning, then what I want you to do, if, if you're willing to, I want you to make a commitment to God, not to me, not to this church. I want you to make a commitment to God to simply for the next 30 days, practice this. 
Now, I'm not saying that every day God's going to bring somebody into your life, but I want the eyes to be peeled. I want you to be ready. I want you to be intentional. I want you to be intrusive. I want you to be ready for that investment to spring forth and to be looking in every situation of every day. I mean, with bated breath, you know, what's God, who's God going to bring me today? Whose path am I going to cross today? Where is my Samaria today? And so what we're going to do is on the way out, I ask that you would grab, if you want to make this commitment for 30 days, you have 30 people. One person per day is the average. If it doesn't happen, it's not your fault, but, but you're trusting that God will bring one person into your life per day in your normal go-abouts, in your normal things, your normal habits, your normal routines, and you will do a couple things. You will either, and, and I want to give you some options. You'll either A, and this is my desire above all, that you'll witness to that person. That you'll tell them about what Christ has done for them. The second option is that you'll tell them about our church. Maybe that's just verbally. The third option is maybe to give them one of these cards. You're invited. Our address and information is on the back. That's, I'm saying what I'm saying is you don't have to say a thing. You can say, hey, now, now please don't do this. <laughs> this service was horrible. You're the worst waitress ever. Come to our church. <laughs> okay? Uh, uh, don't do that. Um, maybe you want to invite them to the Why I Believe series. We can make more of these. You can hand these out. We have another card that's coming out that's going to have all our activities for the upcoming year. And you can hand them that and say, man, look what we got going on at our church. We would love to have you come. But, but here's the thing. When you engage them like that, don't be like, I did it. I'm done. Our deal's okay. We're good. Okay. If, if there's an opening, if there's an opportunity, if there's a conversation, allow the Spirit of God to, to work in you, to talk through you, to, to say what, you know, give it up to Him. This is a, this is a spiritual building exercise as, as much for that person as it is for you. And so, so we want you to engage people and, and have that conversation and, and to be able to see what God can do through you if you're just willing. If you'll just trust Him. If you just say, okay, I can do this. Little steps of faith. The other thing is a, our True Spirituality uh, churchwide campaign that we're starting next week. You can invite them to that, and we can get some cards for you for that. And uh, th- there's just a lot of opportunities. I mean, if you just want to say, our church is at such and such, you know, and, and we're having this and this, please come. I would, I would suggest that maybe you do something that's very kind and out of the ordinary. You get a little intrusive, like Mike does. Mike stops at the gas station up here every day when he comes to work and he buys a cup of coffee for someone, you know, sometimes he gets, wow, thank you so much, and sometimes he gets no response, and the person just walks away. Um, it's kind of crazy what people will do, but I promise you, they will not turn around and stab you, okay? <laughs> they won't do anything crazy. Well, I can't make that promise, but y- y- what I'm saying is don't be so scared. Don't be so fearful to, to open up and to, to be intentional about meeting these people and to be intrusive, and so what I'm going to do is we're not, we're not, this is a little spontaneous, sorry, Joe, we're not going to do a song here at the end. What we're going to do is we're going to pray. And before we pray, I'm just going to have a word of silence. And and I want you, uh, not a word of silence, a moment of silence. I want you to just contemplate if this is something that you feel God wants you to do. And if it is, then I want you to grab a bottle of water on your way out. And on that bottle of water is a little cord. And it's, let me see if I put it in my pocket. Nope, it's actually, they're actually on the bottle of water. And so it looks like this. It's got a little bead on the end. And it comes off of this bottle of water pretty easily. It can be used as a bookmark, it can be used as a bracelet, you can hang it from your rear view mirror, you can put it in your Bible, you can put it somewhere in your car, you can hang it from your keys, you, you, know, you can do whatever you want with it, but it's just a reminder that Christ is the living water, and that we're to constantly be thinking and waiting for that appointment to arrive. That we can be intentional, and that we can be intrusive in other people's lives to a point that's good. If you're willing to do that, you don't have to tell me, you don't have to tell anybody else, just grab a bottle on your way out. And that'll be between you and God for the next 30 days that you'll commit to do this. That you'll commit to try to talk to someone about Christ, about the church, about our programs, about something to open, up, to open them up and to engage them spiritually. We're going to do that in a moment. But I also want to give anybody here that maybe doesn't know Christ as their Savior an opportunity to taste and see that the Lord is good. Christ came to that woman and he's, he's coming to you and he's, he's offering salvation. He's offering eternal life to you. If you'll simply repent of your sins, that's turning and saying, I know those things are wrong. I know I'm a sinner. I need to trust in Jesus Christ. If you'll do that, if you'll believe in him, he will save you this morning. If that's you this morning, how you 
find out more about that. If you're still confused, you want to talk to me, you want to pray to accept Christ, what I want you to do is grab a Bible and come to the front after the service. Okay, come talk to me, and, uh, and I'll speak to you about what the Word of God says about having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So we're going to pray. Please, please don't take this flippantly. Please don't just take a bottle because you're thirsty. Okay? Only take a bottle if you're going to do this. If you want to give it to one of your children, that's fine as well, but explain to them the significance of it. Okay? Tell them what we're doing. Share it with them. Let them be a part of it. And that'll be between you and the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your love. We thank you that you have spoken to us or that you were intentional about seeking us and that you were intrusive in our lives to the point that we came to know you. I pray, Lord, if there's someone here today that doesn't know you, that today would be the day of their salvation. Lord, I pray for the next 30 days in March, Lord, that we would seek out, that we would be intentional, we would look for opportunities to share about you, about our church, about what you're doing here. Lord, that we would seek out those opportunities and then we would be a little bit intrusive uh, uh, to the point of being good and, and, and helping and, and, and being there for people that we might not even know. And Lord, then I pray that we would realize and understand and see the investment that's made. We thank you, we praise you. It's in Christ's name I pray all these things. Amen. God bless you, Cornerstone. Have a great week.